Hello everybody, welcome back to this electronic structure series. So I'm going to talk about today about finding a transition state. So this will be a first introduction to the topic. I'm going to make a, a series uh, about this. So a transition state is a, a structure or a molecular configuration that it connects uh, certain reactants and products. So it cannot be isolated, although apparently there are several very fast spectroscopic techniques that allow to observe uh, structures that are close to the transition state. Uh, mathematically, it is what is called a saddle point. So it's in the space of all possible atomic coordinates, all possible bond lengths and angles and everything, the saddle point it is a minimum in all these coordinates. So it's the most stable structure in all coordinates except for one, which is the coordinate related to the, uh, the reaction coordinate from the reaction that we are trying to understand. So uh, if we, for example, travel the minimum energy path that would be the, the easiest way if you're trying to cross between two mountains would be the lower energy path that you can take to cross to the other side so for example if we plot along that path we could see something like this which is uh, this is an example from wikipedia is the uh, sn2 nucleophilic uh, substitution of a uh, hydroxide attacking uh, bromomethane to produce uh, methanol and bromide. So the transition state is the local maximum along this path, but it is a minimum with respect to all other coordinates. So, for example, some bond and also some angle has usually uh, some kind of uh, energy a potential energy uh, dependence that is this type of blue well which is sometimes described with a uh, formula that's called the Morse potential so but all these kind of bonds are usually approximated for the purpose of calculating uh, more efficiently as a uh, harmonic oscillators so the green um, curve represents a basically a quadratic function which is an uh, the potential energy of a harmonic oscillator and the potential the potential energy with respect to the bond distance is basically one half times k the force constant of the bond or, or the spring times the distance squared so these relations here allow to calculate the frequency of the bond vibration that or the fundamental frequency of the bond vibration that depends on the force constant k and the reduced mass mu so mu is a reduced mass is a basically a kind of an average of the masses of the two parts that are vibrating it's not really an average it's, it's related to both the masses that are vibrating so basically, if you have a higher force constant, you have a higher frequency uh, of vibration. And if you have larger masses of your atoms, you have a lower frequency. And this is the, the inverse formula where the force constant can be derived from the frequency. These frequencies are measured by IR. So basically, for a normal vibration, K is positive. So th that means the curvature of the uh, of the potential energy is upwards so uh, therefore the frequency is real no because the square root of a positive quantity is real so for a transition state the curvature of the of the bond or the potential energy curve in that direction it is negative so k is negative and therefore the a frequency of the mode of the vibrational mode or other mode that is involved in the transition state is imaginary so that's why people talk about imaginary frequencies regarding a uh, transition states 
So I'm going to show an example here. This is from a work that I'm going to cite in the next slides. It was a collaboration where I did some calculations of the reaction of N heterocyclic olefins and uh, exa uh, fluorobenzene. So this is the part of the input file that's, that matters. And I'm, I want to show here that at the bottom of the graph, I selected the two atoms uh, that I wanted to. So this is the structure at the beginning of the optimization. I, I draw the structure myself and the distance between the atoms I care about. I could have chosen any of the carbons in the hexafluorobenzene. So the distance is 3.485 angstrom. And it here, it says two atoms selected, C9 and C32. So what I have to do here for what I'm going to do originally before finding the transition state is do a relaxed surface scan. A relaxed surface scan is a geometry optimization where I constrain certain bond lengths or bond angles or even dihedral angles could be uh, to have a fixed distance. And ORCA, and it is called relax because I let all the other um, all the other coordinates to relax, to go to their possible minimum. But that, that particular coordinate are restricted. So to do this, we have the keyword opt here. I do frequency afterwards. And in the uh, geom uh, field of the input file, I use the word scan and put B. B is for bond. If I put A, it would be angle, and I would need to define three atoms. If I put D, it would be dihedral, and I would have to define four atoms. So bond between atoms 8 and 31. So this is important. Notice that the atoms selected in here in the graphical software, this was ChemCraft, say C9 and C32. This is because most uh, visualization software count atoms starting from one, but ORCA counts atoms starting from zero. So you always need an also orbitals and everything else. So you always need to uh, subtract one from the atom numbers that you have in your visualization program. But if you are just based on the text, uh, that you have in the inputs and outputs files in ORCA, if you don't interact with the graphical software, you have to always start counting from zero. So basically, atoms 8 is the olefin carbon, and 31 is one of these, uh, the marked uh, carbon in the hexafluorobenzene. So I start from the distance that I already had in the structure, 3.485 angstrom. I finish at 1.25, which I later realized it was too short for a carbon-carbon bond. I could have gone to 1.35, would have been the same. And I go in 20 steps. So I put end, and then I have an end for the geom uh, field. So the number of ends is always something that can be a source of error in your program that you miss one end and the program the the, the calculation doesn't run. So I'm also using a pseudo solvent exam within the SMD solvent model. So I'm going to talk about solvation models another time. I could so what I did is first I did this relaxed surface scan that I'm going to show later and then I picked the local maximum and did a transition state optimization. But I could have done that in one file because this is a this turned out to be a more or less easy problem. So if I just change instead of putting opt, I do scan ts, what it will do is do a relax of a scan and it will find the maximum, the local maximum in that scan, and then it will do a transition state optimization on that a maximum. So I added this keyword here, full scan true, because if you don't add it, the moment it finds the local maximum, it will switch to the transition state optimization and will not finish the relaxed surface scan. And uh, generally, 
you start a relaxed surface scan from far away. So the last points are the most interesting points. So if you just stop at the transition state and you don't calculate the rest, you may be missing some interesting information. So I prefer to have the full scan. So now I am going to uh, show a video about the of the relaxed surface scan, and then we're going to discuss the profiles, the energy profile. So now what I show here, and here is the citation from the work, uh, the calculations in the paper are not as detailed as I'm explaining here because it was an experimental paper. I, there were only a few graphs. So what I'm showing on the left, it's the full scan that involves all the intermediate geometries, not only the um, final geometry at each scan step but all the intermediates while it's doing optimization so you can see that you get to a local maximum here so this is number of steps there were many steps uh, and basically then there is a region that's very complicated and it was the problem the geometry was not converging for a certain step that uh, is probably related to this rearrangement of the uh, the adduct at the end where the HF molecule is, is produced Dude, uh, actually before that time there was a time that it was, it was not finding the correct uh, optimi optimized structure so I'm showing this to show that if you get the results that look strange that doesn't mean that it's not, uh, it's not the correct uh, thing that happens what happened here is actually that there are two transition states. So there was first a transition state for the CC bond formation reaction that was a concerted aromatic uh, nucleophilic substitution. And then there was another transition state was the proton uh, dissociation from the carbon and forming the HF bond. So that was an, a second transition state, but not the one that I was studying in this part of the calculation. So on the right, I plotted the final energy. So there are many, uh, much less energy. So I'm not doing the whole optimization energies during the optimization of each relaxed surface scan step, but I take the final energy. And this is much smoother until after I go, so the transition state would be around 2.05 or 2.1 angstrom carbon-carbon distance, but then afterwards there was a jump in energy, probably because of this rearrangement. So when you have this kind of phenomena, these jumps in the relaxed surface scan, at least in my limited experience with this, it usually means that you have not described the chemical environment accurately enough, and then there has to be a rearrangement but there's no not enough stabilization of the intermediates do, during that kind of rearrangement that may happen for example if you are doing some kind of a attack nucleophilic attack with a water molecule or something like that and you don't have enough other solvent molecules to hydrogen bond so at some point molecules are very high in energy and go to very low energies because they form a new hydrogen bond which in normal solution that would not be the case so usually when you have very strange jumps is because chemically you have not described the problem accurately enough the figure on the left can be plot for example with chemcraft also can be possibly plot with avogadro the figure on the right, I made it myself in a plotting program. So basically at the end of the output file of this surface scan, there is a, a table of distances and energies, the actual energy. So I copied that 
uh, that two column list to a program is similar to origin is called uh, Cy Davis and basically I uh, manually transform the hard tree energies into kcal per mole that can be used uh, done using the energy converter uh, website so and then I plot this myself so then I did a transition state optimization based on the maximum that I had found from the scan and I got these frequencies after the transition state optimization I got a minus 335.88 wave numbers imaginary mode so it says imaginary although it has a minus so it's basic, basically because it's easier or more comfortable not to put the imaginary constant i or j or whatever variable people use so the minus means imaginary actually so the frequency is imaginary because the time the force constant is negative and there are two other smaller imaginary modes minus 54 and minus 25 so I'm going to, and there, there are no more. So in principle, only one uh, imaginary mode should be found. So if you see this and you are not experienced, you may say, okay, this I, I couldn't find the transition state. This didn't work. So you should not be so fast. You should check what these imaginary modes are. So I'm going to show some two animations of these imaginary modes, and then that will be it for this video. So this is the animation of the frequency corresponding to minus 335 and you can clearly see that this is the bond formation reaction that this is actual transition state uh, that we are interested in at least it looks to be and this is the other vibration the the imaginary vibration with minus uh, 54 wave numbers if you see that is basically some methyl group vibrations uh, which are not directly involved in the transition state so that happens that happens many times because the optimization is a very complicated uh, phenomenon and there are several causes of numerical error so the minus 54 is probably either some kind of numerical error or it is a meaningless rotation because anyone who has done NMR knows that methyl groups in solution tend to rotate so uh, it is quite common that in an optimization that not there may not be a real unique uh, orientation of the methyl groups that is a minimum so there may be very easy very low barrier rotations and that may cause sometimes that you get imaginary frequencies because it kind of the calculation doesn't exactly know what would be the correct orientation from the methyl groups so you can try to rerun that optimization with a tighter conversion settings or you could leave it like that i will not uh, i always i clearly left it like that if not i would not be showing that file but it's your decision and it's the it depends on your experience so that's all for this video we'll continue talking about this on on other videos and trying to show some more difficult cases thank you